Donnie and Dolly. The team is supported by ableauctions.ca. Closing your business, we can help. It is Wednesday, and all of our guests today are brought to you by Able Auctions and ableauctions.ca. Um, lots of response from ambidextrous people. Uh, this is uh, from Rainway. Rainway? Peter in Langley. Rainway. I play golf right, hockey left, throw right-handed, and kick left-footed, well-balanced. Well-balanced? I do everything myself left-handed, yeah, I'm except right. for throw. I, yeah. I throw my dad... Uh, it was a long story. I'll, I'll, I'll tell it later. <laughs> I had an old school dad. We all did. Yeah. Well, well not not everybody. Not the kids today. Jeff Patterson yeah, joins us true. now from Sakaris and Price, the Rinkwide uh, podcast, the hockey news. Uh, Jeff, thanks for doing this, sir. How, how are you? You golf right-handed, don't you? I am a lefty, Donnie. Oh, I'm a, a lefty. Mess, though. No, I'm, yeah. a, I'm a mess. I, I, I throw right-handed. I write right-handed. I golf left. I kick left-footed. Uh, but I come from a family that's a little messed up as well. I have identical twin brothers who are older. Than, I'm not one of them, but my older brothers are identical twins. One plays hockey left and one plays hockey right, which is wow. bizarre for identical twins. But if we're going down that road, I'm not sure people don't. Daniel and Henrik, they both play hockey left-handed. Yes. But one of them writes right-handed and one writes yes, left-handed. Right. And I remember there was a yeah. photo of them signing contracts somewhere along the line. I thought, wow, like, I didn't know that about them. But uh, there you go. Tidbits about the Sedins on Donnie and Dolly today. Yeah. So uh, speaking of the Sedins, nice segue. Uh, Ryan Johnson going on yesterday about their involvement in Abbotsford and how much it helped uh, the Abbotsford uh, Canucks. What can you tell us about that, Jeff? Yeah, it was locker cleanout day and exit meetings for the Abbotsford Canucks after their uh, second round uh, defeat at the hands of the best team in the American Hockey League, the Calgary Wranglers. And Ryan Johnson was made available to the media uh, and one of the questions, I just asked him about uh, the Sedins uh, and their role in Abbotsford and sort of the the hand that they played in the development of individual players. But also, look, I think it was an exceptional season down in Abbotsford, uh, all things considered, uh, to get to the playoffs, to win that opening round, to push a team like the Calgary Wranglers, to have some legitimate prospects in the system now, and to see that they've got a, a coach in place that is coaching them the way that uh, you know, the, the big league organization wants them to be prepared so that when guys get uh, the call, you know, they can step in at the National Hockey League level. And I give the Sedins a ton of credit. Like, you know, the Hall of Fame careers, they don't need to be back in the American Hockey League, but they spent that first year in the organization, if you recall, sort of shadowing the front office. Mm -hmm. And I think they recognized that, you know, the day-to-day -day dealings of building a hockey club, maybe that wasn't for them at this stage of their lives, that they still wanted to be on the ice and hands-on with players. And so... You would see them at the big league practices, but you know, two or three times a week, they'd make the trek out to to Abbey and on the ice there. Ryan Johnson talked about how they were totally invested in the you know the film room and doing video and spending time just talking to these young players. And if you think about a you know Linus Carlson, a young Swede far yeah. from home, his first year in North America, to have these two icons that are there as resources on a daily basis, Nils Hoaglander, you know, another Swede. Um, Again, I, I think that Daniel and Henrik, like they were out there on the ice, but just as sounding boards, as guys that have been there and you know reached the highest heights in the National Hockey League, inducted into the Hall of Fame last year, uh, to be there for Archdeep Baines, who grew up watching Daniel and Henrik, to have them there on a you know uh, every other day basis, uh, just an incredible opportunity. And so Ryan Johnson was highly complimentary. Of course, he played with the Twins. He's you know, been a friend and a colleague, but uh, he just he couldn't say enough good things about uh, how hands-on they have been and how instrumental they have been in bringing along some of these young players that you know, I think one day will uh, play for the Vancouver Canucks. Zero controversy. I can't think of anything when it comes to the Sedins yeah. and their time with the Canucks, except for in in a minor way uh, this week. They're involved uh, on the ice with some off-season workouts with some members uh, of the Canucks, some bottom six members of the Canucks, and the Canucks got fined fifty grand because of it. Just your take on that situation, Jeff. Yeah, I was a little surprised. Uh, look, I, I think most of these guys know uh, the off-season rules. Are they experts in the CBA? Probably not. Certainly not the players. That's not their job. That's why they have agents. But uh, I think the organization, and Patrick Alvin owned it afterwards, after the draft lottery, when he did media, and he said, ultimately, that's on me. Um, 
but to me, there's just so much gray area in all of this. This was the week after their season ended. And as Patrick Levine explained, like there were some guys that thought they might be in consideration for the World Hockey Championship. And so they weren't ready for their seasons to be done. There were some injured guys that, you know, the medical staff probably wanted to see one or two times out on the ice just before they sent them home uh, for the summer. Uh, I guess the hitch in all of this was that you just can't have anybody from the coaching staff or management uh, out there you know, running the drills. So it has to be guided by the players themselves. Uh, whatever the case, it's 50 grand. I mean, that's uh, a rounding error on the Canucks budget in the big picture. And if they were able to work with some of these young players to send them home for the offseason with a few more things to think about and to train, uh, then, you know, it's probably money well spent. I just find, you know, I talked about the world championship. Like, why is it okay for anybody that plays for the Arizona Coyotes or the Ottawa Senators to go play for Team Canada and work with Andre Turnier or DJ Smith over there uh, after their seasons are done, but it's not okay for, like, I, I, to me, maybe the teams that have been eliminated should get a couple of weeks grace that they can do a little bit of on ice while other teams are still playing. Big picture, I don't think it's a big deal, but at the end of the day, rules are rules. It's there stated clearly, and uh, you do hope that people in the organization understand uh, the collective bargaining agreement the way that it is laid out. Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. Uh, Elias Pettersson nominated for the King Clancy Trophy. A lot of people don't realize his work off the ice, uh, Jeff. I, and for me, this is about the maturity and the growth of Pettersson, and I, I really like the fact that he got nominated uh, for the King Clancy. Yeah, I, I think that just speaks to his growth and development. Uh, we saw it on the ice, obviously, with the 102-point season that he put up for the Vancouver Canucks. And, you know, for him to spend some of his time. Uh, and, and these guys do such a good job. Like, I'm always amazed that you can come up with one player off a team that does a ton in the community when you think about uh, Canuck Place and some of the other initiatives that the Vancouver Canucks support, uh, their charitable wing as well. But, uh, yeah, nice to see him singled out. I was a little disappointed, quite frankly, for Brock Besser. I kind of thought that uh, maybe he would be a finalist for the Masterton Award, which is for perseverance, and dedication, and commitment to hockey. And we know that the struggles that he uh, played through this past year with the passing of his father, Duke, uh, at the same time, that's one of those weird awards to me that I kind of feel should be left at the at the team level. I think you should have a nominee from each team but I don't like pitting one guy's hardship against another guy's hardship. Like, you know, Chris Letang, he lost his father. He also played through a, a yeah. stroke. I mean, incredible story, but Clayton Keller broke a leg and battled yeah. back all last summer to come back and put up incredible numbers this year. And Alex Stalock at the age of 35, you know, still going strong and apparently was hit hard by COVID and, and you know, had to, was able to carve out a place in the National Hockey League. So they're all incredible stories. I, I don't know. There's just something about pitting one guy against another uh, to no, come up with a winner. Yeah. I kind of feel like it should be left at the team level and just salute all 32 of the team nominees. Jeff, uh, we talk about the core in Vancouver. Are they good enough? Pedersen, Hughes, and Demko. Well, I'll tell you one thing right now. If the Leafs lose tonight, you know what core is going to be talked about. Marner, Matthews, Tavares, Nylander. Oh, boy, I, I don't even want to read the Toronto newspapers tomorrow if these guys lose tonight. It's going to be unbelievable, the reaction. Uh, yes, uh, without a doubt. And and I think it goes way deeper than that. I think you look at the coaching staff. I think you look at the management group. Uh, I, like there's This takes me back to that first round of 2011. I know that there are differences, obviously, but you know there was so much on the line organizationally for the Vancouver Canucks in that Game 7 against Chicago just because of the fact that it had been three straight years against the Blackhawks. You know, Alan Vigneault hadn't been able to get his team over the hump. They had squandered the 3 nothing lead. I still believe uh, a decade later that had the Canucks lost to the Blackhawks, you know, massive organizational changes would have taken place. But they did get it right in overtime when they slayed the Dragon. I'll give the Leafs an opportunity to at least win a hockey game here. I mean, they've been close, the overtimes. Uh, but it was shocking and really has been in this round uh, just how neutralized guys like Matthews and Marner and Nylander and Tavares, I mean, the star power on that Toronto team, it's an incredible assembly of talent. We know that, but one thing in the regular season, and uh, yeah, when you think of the celebration in Toronto for getting out of the first round for the first time in 20 years, oh. uh, you know, a week later, they could be swept by the other Florida team. A uh, pretty incredible storyline there. So let's see how it all plays out. I have to think that some of those best Leaf players have more to give, but ultimately uh, it may not be enough to uh, to win a game or certainly to win this round against the Florida Panthers. 
Jeff, the Chicago Blackhawks went all out to land Connor Bedard, and they did. Vancouver uh, didn't go all out. Should that bother Vancouver hockey fans? Well, I think it did. I think it still does. And the fact that uh, the Canucks stayed put at 11th, you know, they'll add a nice piece, but they're not going to add a franchise and game changer, certainly uh, when you're drafting, you know, outside the top 10. So <coughs> now it's on the it's on the scouting staff to do its due diligence to come up with uh, the best player available, obviously, in that position. But yeah, I mean, we just spent time talking about rich storylines. Uh, hard to come up with anything bigger than a North Vancouver guy that grew up rooting yeah. for the Vancouver Canucks. And of course, you know, a, a lot of this will be the same stuff next year with Macklin Celebrini, another Vancouver guy uh, with strong connections to the city and, and to the Canuck organization. And we'll see where the, the hockey club is there. But uh, look, there was a lot of backlash, I thought, on social media about the Blackhawks just because yeah. of the dark decade and the fact that, you know, other teams, Arizona and Jersey, had been punished by the National Hockey League and had first round picks taken away. And here are the Blackhawks who, you know, have this sexual abuse scandal, sweep it under the rug. I know that a lot of the personnel involved no longer there but it's still the works family and the ownership group and you know you saw that incredible story that in the hours after the lottery balls uh deemed that yeah. Bernard would wind up there you know they're selling millions and millions of dollars in season tickets already for next season so uh, look selfishly uh, i'm glad he's in the west so that we'll see him and maybe the canucks and other franchises aren't so thrilled that he's in the west but uh, i like the fact that uh, he's in the western conference but he's not in the pacific division and the other thing, too, is uh, look, an incredible junior career, like one of the great junior careers of all time. You know, now he's going to make the step up, and he projects to be an incredible player at whatever level he plays. But remember, too, that I think at the end of the season, the Blackhawks' leading scorer had 35 points. Like, There's a lot of work to be done. Yes, they stripped it down. They traded away a ton of players, including a heritage player like Patrick Kane. We don't know about Jonathan Taves' future, but we saw the send-off. It's not going to be in Chicago if he continues to play. So they've got a lot of work to do. Connor Bedard is one hell of a piece to start the rebuild there. And the other thing, too, is, uh, the Blackhawks have two first rounders this year. Yeah. They had three last year. I mean, that's five first round picks. That's a pretty good way to jumpstart a rebuild. And we know that the Vancouver Canucks just refused to go down that path in terms of uh, trying to accumulate as much draft capital as possible. All right, get back to one of your 700 jobs. Thanks for this, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> hey, quickly, guys, I, I heard you talking about JT Miller in the U.S. Open yes. right off the top. Uh, I, I believe Joe Pavelski is the best golfer of the current crop of active national okay. hockey leaguers. You may recall he lost in a playoff to Tony Romo last year at that American Century oh, Championship right, 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 in yeah, Tahoe. Yeah. So I don't know if he's a scratch golfer, but he's pretty close. But uh, sounds like JT, JT Miller must be pretty close as well. So uh, somewhere, someday. I think the NHLPA has like an annual golf tournament. I don't know how many guys show up for it, but it uh, would be interesting to see. But yeah, I think Pavelski uh, is the guy at the top of the list, but he's a little busy scoring uh, yeah. all sorts of goals here in this second round of the playoffs. Yeah, using those hands to uh, tip in pucks. AJH Delaney's okay, Tyron Langley uh, inbox, uh, Jeff. Uh, Re JT Miller, I would not want to be his caddy. <laughs> and I think a lot of people who have watched him play <laughs> hockey feel the same way. Thanks for this, Jeff. All right, guys, thank you. Uh, you bet.